This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. Well, we have a uh, long program ahead of us, and so might as well uh, start. Uh, first of all, I'd like to welcome you all to our annual uh, Transplant Symposium uh, in the Napa Valley. For those who don't know me, my name is Flavio Vincenti, and this July, it will be 40 years since I joined the Transplant Service. I started uh, on the faculty on July 1st, 1976, uh, and along with uh, Bill Amen launched Transplant Nephrology at uh, UC UCSF and our uh, wonderful collaboration with our surgical colleagues and you know, we made sure they are, we have been one team uh, ever since. The same reasons I got the transplantation in 1976 are true today. One is driven by the exciting ch uh, and challenging science and working with a great group of colleagues. Uh, number two, uh, having the satisfaction of seeing patients getting off dialysis, getting transplanted and having a dramatic change in their lifestyle. And number three, over the years, we've had just the most wonderful uh, relationship with all of you who refer our patients to us and it does really make a huge difference that we can relate to each other, we, we're colleagues, we're friends, and again, we want to use uh, the opportunity every year in Napa to present you uh, what's happening at UCSF, our new trials, and, uh, and, uh, and then you know, choose topics that pertain to your, to your practice. And very importantly, when, when you, f you fill in your uh, uh, CME evaluation, is to uh, provide us with topics I'd like to hear uh, next year, because we use that. I mean, it's important for our CME certification. But uh, we're here primarily uh, to share the knowledge uh, with you. And we'd like to know what are the areas that you like to have us emphasize uh, at these meetings. I'd like, of course, as every year, uh, thank Peggy Millar, uh, my administrative assistant, who helps out with this meeting. And, uh, and of course, uh, both uh, industry and uh, the UCSF Medical Center, who help support this important educational activity. So without any further delay, I'd like to uh, have Dr. Roberts uh, present the state of transplantation at UCSF. Of course, Dr. Roberts is the head of the transplant service. And uh, every year, he give us an update of what's going on at our center. Well, thank you, Flavio. I think I'm the second longest faculty member here. <laughs> but I came 12 years after Flavio, so. Um, <clears throat> so thanks all for coming. Um, let's see, do we got the? There we go. So first off, I'd like to thank our sponsors. And you know, obviously, this event takes a lot of people to help us get it done. Um, one of the people that really helps us get us done is Peggy Millar. Peggy, hey, for Peggy. <laughs> and Peggy helps us get all the educational grants uh, submitted for all this whole list of sponsors. So you can see it's an enormous amount of work she does to have this, along with hurting all the cats and dogs of the faculty to get them to turn in their presentations and do all that kind of stuff. It's really a, a lot of work. And here are the cats and the dogs. <clears throat> um, so uh, they've all been here fairly long. Um, I, I'm, I'm not staying late because Nancy's graduating as the chair of the department tonight. <clears throat> you know, she's uh, retiring and they're having sort of a graduation party for her along with the graduation of the residents. Um, but those are the surgeons. I'll talk a little bit about the two new additions to adult transplant nephrology, and then we have our, <coughs> our pediatric uh, colleagues also who've uh, taken up residence at the 
new hospital at Mission Bay, which is quite exciting. It takes a village to get anybody to transplant, I'll tell you that. <clears throat> and these are the people that really do it in terms of helping us get, uh, you know, the 350 plus <clears throat> kidney and uh, transplants that we do every year. And so these are all the people that are, that are so important to, to all your patients in terms of getting them uh, from the, <clears throat> you know, dialysis to transplant. And then after they're transplanted, they need a lot of help, particularly early on. We have our nurse practitioners, um, both the inpatient and the outpatient, who uh, um, <clears throat> are key to helping us get these patients uh, on the right track and keeping them on the right track. And if you know any nurse practitioners that are interested in transplant, we're hiring. So let them know. <clears throat> um, the... Management, you know, obviously the cats and dogs <clears throat> take a lot of people to keep them in a straight line, and these are people that do that along with the social workers that help us um, get our patients uh, through transplant and also help them with all those financial problems that they have, keeping them in transplant medications afterwards. So, <clears throat> as you know, Steve Tomlanovich retired, and Deb Aidy has uh, taken her job as a taking his job as medical director, and so we're really looking forward to that. Um, <clears throat> that was just a recent change. We've had two new additions to the staff. Dr. Xiang Kong's coming from the Lei Hospital um, and joining us on faculty, and Jun Choi is one of our um, transplant uh, nephrology fellows, and she'll be joining the transplant team. We've got our <clears throat> expanded team of deceased donor transplants and our We've, ex we've added uh, nurse practitioners to the uh, post-nurse practitioner kidney team. So we're, <clears throat> we're continuing to expand to keep up with all the uh, patients that get a, need a transplant and then get one. So these are the number of people on the wait list. You can see about <clears throat> a quarter of the people in the five-state region are actually on the UCSF uh, wait list and about 5% <clears throat> about of the nation's uh, patients that need transplants on our, ways, our uh, wait list. You can see that you guys do a really good job of taking care of these patients while they're waiting for transplant and our observed mortality rate on this of the patients on the wait list is, the, <clears throat> is, not, any, is not any difference than, than expected despite the long wait times to transplant. In terms of <clears throat> the number of transplants you can see, um, last year was kind of a banner year for us in terms of the total number of kidney transplants, uh, both living and uh, deceased donor transplants increased, um, and our paired exchange, you know, where we change kidneys between uh, donor and recipient pairs has also uh, uh, was a good year last year. So just a couple things that, uh, you know, sort of the bad news about transplant is that <clears throat> we put about 950 people on our wait list every year. and. Last year, as you saw, we did, I don't know, what, a 200 living donor, I'm sorry, 150 living donor kidney transplants and 200 deceased donor transplants, and that, those numbers have been pretty stable. They're going up a little bit, but so you can imagine that of all the patients we put on our wait list, only one in five get, <coughs> survive long enough to get a transplant if they don't have a living donor. The rest either are inactive on the wait list, become, they die, or become too sick to transplant. So that's why we're trying to get more people to get living donor transplants, and for the diabetics, it's even worse, only that one in 10 actually will survive to get a transplant of the people that we put on our waiting list. And so we're <clears throat> trying to encourage patients to undergo living donor uh, kidney transplantation. These are our results in terms of the looking at UCSF and the U.S. data. You can see, you know, we have a 98% uh, one year and 94% uh, three-year uh, survival and uh, of patient survival and our graph survivals are 95 and, and 90 and you imagine you know even when Flavia and I started we we're you know probably a 50 60 percent one-year survival and that was when Flavio started before cyclosporin I started at cyclosporin so you can see these results are just amazing you know in terms of where we've come <clears throat> over the time period we've been at UCSF. So <clears throat> a couple things, Dr. Fries is going to talk, or Dr. Stock, I guess, is going to talk about the new kidney allocation system. Um, it was implemented in December 2014. It's changed uh, a lot of kind of how patients get transplanted. 
Um, we're not, it's now on dialysis wait time, so we sort of went to a flurry of contacting the dialysis units and made sure that we had our dialysis start times the same as yours. Um, kidneys are measured by what's called the kidney donor profile index, which is sort of a measure of how good that kidney is. Basically, the younger you are, the better the, better the kidney is. And so we try to match the most appropriate kidney to the most appropriate recipient, trying to match younger donor kidneys with younger donor, younger recipients. And there's also been an increase in transplantation for patients that are highly sensitized, which means that people that were on the wait list for 10 years suddenly got a really high priority for transplantation. And so we transplanted quite a few of those patients in the last year. This is just showing you what the changes were in on a national basis. So the you can see on the left-hand columns the CPRA of the um, here of, it was of the patients that, that were not highly sensitized. The number of those patients have has actually gone down in terms of the transplant rate. But you can see that the um, number of patients that are highly sensitized has gone up. And so there's there's been a shift in terms of the transplants going into the more highly sensitized. Patients, we think this will die down after a time because there were sort of all these patients that were been waiting were difficult to match, and all of a sudden they got a national share. So a lot of those people got uh, transplanted, but that was sort of a bolus effect, and it's and it looks like on a both local basis and national basis, it's gradually dying down. Um, you can see that <coughs> we're transplanting more uh, patients <coughs> that were on uh, dialysis for. Uh, for more than five years, and that's sort of, I think this dialysis time helped those patients that, that were on dialysis for a while before they got listed. And then <clears throat> you can see that the in terms of our mix of, of young versus old patients, we've been transplanting somewhat more young patients than we have been transplanting in the past, and that was a, a planned effect of the national, change in the national system. So we've, the other thing is, you know, health care reform is coming. I'm sure you guys are n no strangers to some of the changes that happened. There's a lot of changes in terms of transplant, in terms of uh, patients getting medications, you know, sort of larger co-pays, um, more challenges of getting approval to, to get these patients to be seen for and, and put on the waiting list. And then we're having sort of lots of trouble in terms of the post-transplant getting uh, patients to the um, to have coverage for their medications, and the social workers have spent a lot of time doing that. It's really a, a daily battle in clinic to make sure that all the patients have their meds so that they don't lose their transplants uh, from, because they can't afford their medications. So just around the country, um, deceased donor transplants and have uh, decreased. Um, it's just one of those effects. Nobody's quite sure why, but it, they're as slowly following and living donor donation we think remains the best option for this. In order to try to help all those people that <clears throat> have potential living donors get a transplant, so if you're, if you're an O recipient and you have an A donor, that, that's an incompatible transplant. We can sometimes do those if there's not, if they don't have a lot of, if the recipient doesn't have a lot of anti-antibodies, but the other thing we can do is try to exchange it, so find a, another uh, O and an O recipient where the O donor can't donate to their O recipient, and then we can do a, a sort of a, ch a chain or, a, or an exchange. And so we, this has actually helped us. We ha have an uh, internal exchange um, that we're using with, CP with CPMC. We have the national exchange, and, and we've did about 132 transplants now um, with this exchange. And you saw we did about 30 last year, which has been great, <clears throat> and, and we have a fabulous coordinator who, who helps us get that done. In terms of <clears throat> the standing living donor transplant, blood type compatible, cross match compatible, and, and then we try to match donor size and age. If, it's in, if we have incompatibility of one or more of those above, then we try to do an exchange. So if we have, say, a, <clears throat> a mother <clears throat> who's small and old who wants to donate to her young, <clears throat> large son, we may encourage her to enter the exchange so that her son can get an older, sorry, get a younger kidney and, the, and she could donate to somebody that, that might be more compatible in terms of size and age and also un, <clears throat> has a, have, a have a donor that they can't uh, receive a transplant from because they may be uh, cross-match incompatible, say. So these are the different kinds that sort of we have <clears throat> exchanges between pairs. The other ones we do chains, and the chains of 
have actually been <clears throat> a more interesting uh, kind of thing because you can have get a lot more patients transplanted. You've probably seen these chains of 60 kidneys or so, and so it's a pretty interesting thing. One of the things we're looking at is on a national basis, but we're probably going to start locally, is see if we can start a chain with a deceased donor uh, kidney and, <clears throat> and rather than an altruistic donor. Um, so in terms of the old small donor, the large young recipient, I covered a little bit of this in terms of it, it adds an advantage to the um, recipient who, who is able to get a kidney that may be functioning better at a year as compared to the original donor. The uh, donor can provide a kidney to other patients in need of transplant. The problem is that, and probably why we have trouble getting maybe 40% of the people that could participate in this to do it, is that they are giving the kidney to a recipient they may not know or will never know. And so they, that's sometimes hard for people to get over that kind of a barrier. And what we tell them is that it's really, what you really want is your recipient to get a transplant. If they get your kidney, that's great. But if they don't, what you really want to do is have them get a transplant. And so if you can help them get a transplant by giving it to somebody else, then uh, that, that's <clears throat> really what you want to do. <clears throat> One of the other things uh, just to talk about is uh, Andy Poselt has developed a islet cell transplant for diabetics. That's, um, we're waiting for FDA approval now for that, but as an out um, cropping of that, we're doing uh, auto islet transplants for people that have chronic pancreatitis. So they have a total pancreatectomy. The indication is, is almost always for chronic pain. We can then separate the the islets out of the pancreas that's been removed, we reinfuse those islets into the recipient, and <clears throat> they become in insulin independent and pain free. We're, we're doing both children and adults, and we're one of the few programs in the country to to do this. Um, it really takes a whole like all the, all of the transplant takes a whole team to get this done, and it's it's really a, a, a group effort. So I invite you to join the meeting. Once again, Flavio's ordered up the fabulous weather, so we have a nice time on the, on the cocktail terrace. I don't, I don't know, has it ever rained for this thing? I don't think it's ever rained, so it's great. Thank you very much.